everyone it's so good to be here in the Lord's house and uh, I have been plagued I don't know if it's because Satan did not want us to do all that he desired that, that we desire to accomplish but uh, some would say in the tech field we had gremlins this morning I could not get our screen to work I could not get the computer to work through the sound system and so we don't have the screens today so we're going to edit a little bit with our bulletins, and we're going to start with Onward Christian Soldiers, hymn number 93 in the hymnals. So we're going to do it as they did years and years ago. We're going to do verses 1, 3, and 4, and it's, it's number 93 in the hymnal. 90. Oh, oh, that's right, long tune. Let me get this out real quick. Onward, Christian soldiers. Thank you. 
beautiful day, Lord. We just thank you for being with us during the storm this past week, Lord, and just watching over us and protecting us so we can be here today. Uh, we just pray for the many people that were impacted by uh, the winds and rains, Lord. We just pray that you just uh, lift them up and comfort them this morning. Be with all the uh, people that are out there working to, to get their lives back on track um, today, Lord. Just be with those workers and just uh, guide them, direct them, and uh, keep them safe, Lord. Uh, we just pray for uh, us as we get close to uh, to the Thanksgiving and Christmas season, Lord. We just pray that you, we just put our eyes on you. That we just uh, that we just uh, thank thank you for the many blessings and the different things that we have, Lord. And uh, God, I just pray for a special uh, special blessing on our election, Lord. I just pray that you just uh, put the man that you would have to be. Uh, our president in charge, Lord, and just uh, help us as we make those decisions come election day, Lord, and just be with us in a mighty way as a nation. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, just a, a few announcements that I'm going to go through, and I'll probably be up here doing like this because I lost my contact, and I've got a little spare in today. So it's like a, I almost got like a little spare tire like you put on your car, and it's about that big around. You know that's about like it is in my eye right now, so... Um, not good this morning. But anyway, um, we have next Sunday, we are going to get back to our uh, Sunday school routine that we had prior to the pandemic. So all the uh, normal Sunday school classes that we've had uh, in the past, we'll be getting those going next Sunday. So uh, be here for that. Everybody's looking forward to kind of getting back to normal with that. Uh, also next Sunday, we're having our communion service. Uh, we also are having our deacons meeting, which will be at 8 a.m. And then uh, following the communion service, we'll also be having our business meeting uh, that will be going on right after that. So we're looking forward to all that. So next Sunday be a, will be a busy, uh, busy day. Also with the communion service, uh, we'll be giving you the communion cups. It has the wafer with it like we did the last time uh, when we did communion. And uh, we, we did that for the pandemic reasons where you had the little wafer and you had your juice all in one little cup, we'll be doing that next Sunday. Uh, so hopefully that'll be uh, helping us with all those guidelines as we, uh, as we celebrate Christ during that time. Uh, also, we have uh, our Awanas starting back. Anybody that would like to volunteer uh, for our Awanas, uh, to listen to verses, to do any of those uh, things that we need done on Wednesday night, please let us know that. We're always looking for helpers to, to help out with that. Um, also, we have Operation Christmas Child that's wrapping up. We have to send those uh, boxes off uh, coming up real, real soon. So we need those boxes back ASP uh, AP if you have not done that already. Uh, and don't forget that we need that postage uh, too so we can send those boxes off. Uh, and that's right there in your bulletin how much that is. Uh, also, we're having a Jolly Jays meeting. Uh, it's going to be Thursday, November the 12th. At 10.30 a.m., uh, we'll have some people from Emerald Coast Hospice that will be here uh, speaking, and there will be a meal provided. So we're looking forward to that. Also, this has become very popular as our pastor's fishing trip. Uh, I think it's because we want to see which adults get hooked. I think that's what we're looking forward to the most, see who can dodge the most hooks that day. Uh, but the kids love it. Uh, so we got the fishing trip that's coming up. It's it's pushed back later than normal, but we're trying to get it in uh, before it gets just too awful cold. Uh, we got that Saturday, November the 14th, and we're going to leave here at 8.30, uh, and we'll go have a great time with the kids uh, doing that, and then uh, we'll come back later that morning. Uh, and we, that's always just a great time. The kids loved it last uh, time we did it, and we look forward to it uh, this time as well. Is there any other announcements that I am forgetting? Anybody would like to shout out? Yes. We um, can use um, at least two more adult helpers in the uh, age of uh, 
third, fourth, and fifth graders in Awana to help listen to them practice and learn their verses. Okay, so two more adults in third, fourth, and fifth grade in Awana that we could use uh, to volunteer. Or okay, let Carolee know that, or, or George and Trudy, and we'll be happy to set y'all up with that. That's where our, our need is the most right now. Anybody else? All right, I'm going to do it real quick. I'm going to do it without what I had because I'm getting senile, I guess, and I left it at the house. But I will have it by the end of the service, trust me. Uh, we've got the kiddos last night that went out and trick-or-treated. What a fun time that is. Uh, we usually have a, a neighborhood or two that's uh, around Nikki's sister's house that we go to, and they get to hit all the houses, and it's fun to see all the... The families that, that decorate and try to scare the kids, and then there's there's some. I got tickled last night. We were walking down the uh, the walkway uh, in the little subdivision that we were in, and as we were walking down there, there was one yard where every sprinkler at the house was on. So I guess that was a pretty good sign that they didn't want trick or treaters. But uh, we've got a we got a, a kick out of that because they were just going everywhere, you know. And I thought, well, that's a good way to keep trick or treaters from being at your house, but. Anyway, it's always fun to see the kids. They, they get to dress up. They get to go and, uh, and, and you know, ask trick-or-treat. And if they get candy, that's great. I always get a kick out of listening to the kids, too. That'll be, you, you'd be passing on the street or whatever, and some of them be grabbing about, I don't like that candy. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I wish they had this candy. I don't want Twizzlers. Uh, so that was like, I don't want Twizzlers, I heard one say, uh, that, we were, that we were around last night. But that was, it's always a fun time. And... I was thinking about that in regards to kind of like God and how we deal with God and how God deals with us. You know, God gives us treats too from time to time. And that's through the form of blessings. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's things that we want. Uh, and then it's, sometimes it's like those uh, things that you get in your little Halloween thing that people put in there like dental floss or something like that. You know, why are they giving me dental floss for a treat? But we need it, right? The kids need it. They need the dental floss to get the candy and all that kind of stuff. And God does the same thing with us. He gives us things sometimes that we, that we do want. And then there's sometimes that He gives us things that we need. And then there's sometimes where He doesn't give us things. And those, and those sometimes can be the blessings. And then sometimes He just puts people in our lives that are blessings. And sometimes we, we don't realize that. Sometimes we're like the kid that says, I don't want the Twizzlers, or I, I wanted this, or I wanted that instead, instead of being thankful for what God's uh, put in our lives. So just think about that as you go through this week. What, what has God given you? What, what has God blessed you with that you haven't given a lot of notice, but that you should spend more time thinking Him about as we get into this Thanksgiving season? Uh, and I'll just leave that with you this morning. Thanks. If you have your have your hymnals, if you could turn to 478, 478, this will be the right number. Forgive me, the last song, when I did the copies, it cut the four off of it. And I, I'm sorry about that. But it's 478, C key first. We'll sing both verses. Let's all stand together, please. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. seated in 427 for he alone is worthy all three verses of that great hymn. Give him 
our hymn this morning as we sing together hymn number 426, Victory in Jesus. And we will sing all three verses, and we better stand for this. If we're victorious, and you know, under the will of God and under God's plan, we are victorious in all things. I heard an old, old story. today, we're going to be looking at three different passages in the Word of God, and the message today is the Abrahamic Covenant coming to fruition. Now, with a title like that, you might be thinking, oh no, this is going to be one of those kind of messages. 
Well, we're going to be talking about the importance and how this brings us together and how in the church in Galatia, in fact, the various churches were being bombarded by people who were taking the Word of God, the Old Testament, and saying, hey, by the way, you all don't have it right. It's through the works of Abraham. That is how we have righteousness. And if you don't include that with Jesus, you're wrong. Just recently I was looking through some of my books in my library and I remember a class I took at uh, working at uh, Trinity Evangelical D Divinity School. It was entitled Liberation Theology. Now this is something that is coming to a forefront today. How many of you just by chance looked at your TV put on the news and saw rioters. You ever see rioters on the TV? Okay. That's the way liberation theology saves a person. No, seriously, that's true. And this is something that's coming to the forefront again. A number of years ago, when you looked at the Latin countries in South America and Latin America and Central America, you had the church, the Catholic church, was utilizing these principles and calling it the way to be saved. This is how you get your salvation. You overthrow the rich and the poor get everything and it's shared. It's basically communism. They use guns. They use the AK-47. And they call it a religion. They call it Christianity, liberation theology. And it is something that permeates a lot of the world today. Whether it permeates here or not, it's part of the world. There are other problems that we see the, the church coming against the church. Well, in this ancient day, Paul was very, very disturbed on this brand new church that he just planted. We're getting bombarded, these people, by the local synagogue and the Judaizers were saying, you must do works plus Jesus in order to have salvation. And that is not correct. Jesus' blood and his work is sufficient. You might say, well, I understand that. Well, that's good. Because fellow Christians, as the Lord tarries, this world in general pulls farther and farther away from him. And as a Christian, guess what? We're going to look very different more and more as this world grows farther and farther away from God. So as in the days of the Galatian church here with the days of Paul, so are the days today that we live in. And in fact, in chapter 3, the very first verse is, Oh, foolish Galatians. That's a pretty strong term. Because the Bible warns us about calling each other foolish or fools. God has the right to say that. And guided by the Holy Spirit in this case, it is foolishness getting away from God's word and getting away from true salvation and getting away from the true principles of God when Paul set those up with these people and led these people to, to the Lord and he wanted to see them grow in grace and he wanted to see them grow in their, their faith. And they were getting drawn away into all sorts of different things that, by the way, are part of the old covenant in the Old Testament. I'm going to share some light on this to show that Paul, who knew this very well because he sat at the feet of the greatest Hebrew teacher of the day, Gamaliel, he understood this. Of all of the apostles, he understood this. In fact, I never really thought much on this until just recently when I, when I heard this statement, and I think I shared it last week maybe, uh, or during this time of Galatians, is that Paul, of all of the apostles was the trained one. Peter was, I mean, yes, Peter and the others, they sat at the feet of Jesus. Can't beat that. Not a bad teacher. He's a perfect teacher, okay? I can tell you, I can probably name some teachers that I wish I didn't have in seminary. And this is in Bible college, in seminary. Uh, but, Jesus, perfect. But they were not trained in the law like Paul was. See, Paul was different. And I think one of the reasons why God used them 
to write so many of the books was because he understood the doctrines of the Old Testament and he brought out how they were fulfilled in Jesus Christ for the most part. So, because of this, Paul addresses this issue in, in verse 6 of chapter 3. Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted him to, uh, to him for righteousness. Verse 7. Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. We do thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for the opportunities you give us. And Lord, I ask that today, that this concept of the Abrahamic covenant and how it was fulfilled, and the promises that are given to us as, as Christians today, many of us who are not Jewish, and even those that are Jewish that accept you as Savior, that, did, that this whole promise comes to fruition in its fullness in Jesus Christ. And let us understand this so that we can be ready and prepared for those who might throw different doctrines at us, who might throw things about Jesus and, that it's not the and, it's the Jesus in our lives that brings us our salvation and that we are to serve. And may we always strive for this because the problems that were there in the time of Paul are the same problems that happen today in the church. And we ask this in Christ's name, amen. So he starts out first with Abraham. Now you gotta understand something. Let's recap a little bit back a couple chapters. One of the big contentions with the Galatian church, and not just the Galatian churches, but this also happened in Jerusalem. And it was an argument between Paul and Peter. And Peter, of course, he was, he was the chief apostle at the beginning. When Jesus ascended into the glories of heaven, the one who denied him three times was the one who took the head. And it wasn't that he said, look at me. No, it was he just led. That was Peter, impetuous Peter, who became stalwart Peter. He really did. He changed in the mightiest of ways. What a great change happened in his life. That mouth of his and that lack of common sense and senses, it changed. And I truly believe God worked a great work in him. But one of the things that you have to understand, he was dealing with the church as it began in Jerusalem. Who were the main group of people in Jerusalem? Jewish people. Now the Jewish people believed in the Old Testament. That's what they held to. They held to the law. But the law never would bring righteous, righteousness. The law condemned them because they could not fulfill the law. Paul says if you break one law, you broke it all. And by the way, you have one sin in your life, you, you're a sinner. Babies, we look at them as innocent and everything, but you know, there's a time when a ba in a baby's life where you can tell they get rebellious against you. You ever had a rebellious baby? I see some smiles. Doesn't mean they get up and throw rocks at cars. They're, they're not throwing rocks at cars, but a baby, a baby's rebelliousness could be in a lot of different forms. Rebelliousness is a sin. Now, I do believe this. I believe a baby up until the age of understanding, they are covered with they're, they're covered with God. And that's a whole other message in itself. But even as a young person, do young people do they sin? Have you parents, grandparents, maybe maybe grandpa wants to do this. You ever taken your grandson out or your granddaughter out and said, today we're gonna throw rocks at cars? We're just going to have a fun old time. I'm going to teach you how to sin. Have you ever had, have you ever done that, parents, grandparents, great-grandparents? Have you ever done that? No. We're not, we, we try to correct them from sinning. That we have the sin nature, bottom line, we have the sin nature. If a person doesn't see the sin nature, they don't, they've never had kids and they've never been around a child. And still, they, they got to see the sin nature. I see it. So you, you see it in the store today, very, very commonly. Many times, I want this, and it goes from I want this to a screaming fit. That's a sinful nature. It happens. We see it around us. Well, when we talk about the lives of the Jewish nation, and Peter was dealing with these people, 
they still had vestiges that they still practiced even though they became Christians. And one of those practices was a very important one. It was given to Abraham. And it was called circumcision. It was for the male children. And it was a sign of the covenant that God had with the Jewish nation to show that they are under the umbrella of his grace. It, said, it showed people that they, were, that they were part of the covenant. This was a symbol that God demanded. And he started with Abraham. Now, I'm, we're going to get to this. I'm going to show that this is not, though, the, the place of his righteousness. Abraham's righteousness did not come from this. And then in, on top of that, you had all of the other laws, and there were 613 of them, that the Jewish believers were trying to put on the non-Jewish believers. So you had Peter dealing with the Jewish believers, and I'm going to tell you, he did what most leaders will do. He will put out the bad fires, and if those, if there's problems that he knows, really, that's not where their salvation comes. But they're all doing it. He's not going to argue that big time yet. But Paul comes along. What does Paul do? He knows the law. He knows it very well, better than all of them. He was trained. Not only did he grow up as a Jew, but he was trained to be a Pharisee. Even though he wasn't a Levite, he, was, he worked for them as kind of their security team. Part of that. But he knew the law. He knew it very well. And here he's going out into the Gentile world, and this is, they don't even think on this. And people are coming to Christ. People are being saved. The church is growing. And then Paul comes back to Jerusalem, and there's this. And it's over this concept of the circumcision. And is that required? And they came to the decision that, according to the Bible, that was not needed. And if a Jewish person wanted to do it, they could do it. But the Gentiles did not have to do it. Okay, they came to an agreement. That was done in Jerusalem by the heads of the church of that day. They followed a good biblical principle that really you don't need that to be saved. Well, not only were they pushing that, but they are now bringing up, and, and Paul is going to address the very heart of the problem, the very heart of the issue, the Abrahamic covenant. Hold your place there, and let us go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. And I'll start with verse 1. I'll read all three verses. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, I'll read. But we're going to focus on the third verse. This happens in chapter 12. And this is the Abrahamic covenant that was given to Abraham. This was the founding of the new Jewish nation that would come. This, these will be the chosen people of God. And God will establish this promise to, to point out that Abraham has been chosen by God. Now, the Lord said to Abraham, get you out of your country and, and from your kindred and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing and I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curses you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now we know that Abraham had faith. He trusted the words of God. And hold, uh, you can hold this, hold your place there. And let's go back to Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10. The writer of Hebrews, whether it was Paul or some other one, let me just read this, is very important. This, this section deals with, with Abraham, and it deals, I call this the roll call of the righteous. In chapter 11, verses... 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And when he went out, not knowing where he went, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. First, or the second word in that, verse 8, by faith. Let me try to put this together, and then we'll go back to Galatians. Go back to Genesis 12. And the, the Abrahamic covenant is basically 
verses 2 and 3, focusing heavily on verse 3, and the very last phrase is the most important for all of us. And in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's the promise of the coming Messiah. But this promise that was accepted and, and by faith followed by Abraham, that was what made him righteous. If you go to verse chapter 17, we're not going to turn there, but I'll just take my word for it. Chapter 17, God then tells Abraham, oh, by the way, the sign of your covenant is circumcision. All of the males must go through this. Now, let me, let me share one thing with you. Chapter 17 happened 24 years after God made the Abrahamic covenant with Abraham. According to the book of Hebrews, Abraham trusted Christ, or God, that there was this promise, and it was by his faith, that's what counted him righteous. Now let's go back to Galatians, please. The church of Galatia was being bombarded by people who were using, quote, scripture to say, oh, by the way, you're just halfway there. You have to be Jewish. Now, working at the Holy Land experience, we did have a couple workers who were not Jewish, but who felt if you weren't going to a Messianic synagogue, that's basically a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue, that holds to Christ as their Messiah and Savior, and you're not following all of the Jewish things, you're really not being a Christian. And oh, the biggie now is, if you worship on Sunday and not Saturday, ho oh, oh, ho, oh, we have to talk. And guess who was the sounding board for many of these people? Me. Oh, let's get Dr. Fredericks. We're going to confuse him today. No, I didn't confuse very much. Bottom line is this. When you start adding things to your faith and say, well, you know, I accept Christ as Savior, yes, but I've got to do this and I've got to do this. God does not stand in the heavens with a lightning bolt in one hand and candy in the other and says, oh, by the way, oh, you did good today. I just throw a little bit of candy. Oh, you messed up. I'm going to hit you. He doesn't do that. Now, yes, there are temporal consequences that can happen if we misbehave. I've, I've gone over this numerous times in services. Things can happen if you misbehave. If you make wrong choices, things can happen. But also, too, if you look at the whole book of Job, just because something doesn't work right in your life doesn't mean you messed up. There's a lot of reasons why things happen in our lives. Life is complex. If it wasn't complex, everybody would be doing it right. We have people here that probably are very, very savvy in the world of finance and in your finances, and you've done very well. And some, some of us, like me, I, you know, I got a checkbook. I know I write things in it. I write a check. I, I do checks. I do check my account. I try not to bounce checks. I'm not a financial guru, though. That's why we have a finance committee here. God bless them. But I have other strengths, but, you know, God doesn't stand in heaven saying, I'm going to get you. But also, too, Paul says, don't be sinning, coming that grace will abound. Because sometimes God kind of lets us fall down a little bit. Because he knows that will help us better. So you can't count on grace and mercy from God when you're making mistakes. I've heard too many people say, Easier to ask forgiveness than it is to ask permission. You know what? That's a bad statement. That's not a right statement. That's not biblical. Biblical is if you have a church that has the polity system or the government system of, of having committees, go to your committees. Don't overstep your committees. There are some times where there's emergencies, but still talk to your committees. If you're in a church where that there are, you don't have committees, that's a whole different ballgame. But we've got to be careful how we behave. And in the case of this, you don't want to start adding a bunch of things onto your salvation and onto the gospel. Remember, even in Joshua's day, Joshua was warned, don't go to the right of the, the law, don't go to the left of it. And if I want to do it for you all, right or left? Because if you go to the right, symbolic of adding, if you add, you're going to make mistakes adding. 
If it's to the left, you're taking away symbolically, taking away from the gospel, taking away from the word of God also can hurt you. So we have to be careful there. And that's why Paul is so churned up about this. Because this was a church or groups of churches in Galatia that were going to reach out into a world that needed Jesus. And all of a sudden they were bombarded early on by the wrong influences. So he goes right to the heart of it. Abrahamic covenant. What does this mean? Starting in chapter 12 of Genesis, we're not going back there, God makes a promise with Abraham. He chooses a man in his 80s who would be over 90 when his child is first born, the first child of this covenantal promise. Um, his wife would give birth at 90. This was a couple that was no, it was not by chance that this happened. This was a choosing of God himself. You got to, if anybody says, well, the Jewish nation was like every other nation was by chance. No, it wasn't. Chance is you have 25, 20 year old couples who are just married. There's a good chance there's probably going to be a child in there somewhere. That's chance. Chance is not a 90 year old couple living in tents in the wilderness and they have a child. And by the way, up until that point of 89, uh, Sarah was not able to have a child. That's not by chance. That's a hand of God thing. That's a miraculous thing. God wanted all to know that the Jewish nation was formed by him and was his people. That's what he wanted them to know. But the promise started in chapter 12. The sign of the covenant that was given was chapter 17, 24 years later. So even for Abraham, his... His righteousness was not counted on him doing an act. It was by having faith in God. Now, coming to Galatia. These Galatians, it says in verse 6 once again, even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's right out of the book of Hebrews. Whether Paul wrote that in Hebrews or whether he heard that, however he came to it, the Holy Spirit guided him, that is similar as Hebrews. So bottom line, first and foremost, Abraham was saved by faith. The church in Galatia, according to the word of God, we see it in Romans, we see it in the, in the Gospels, you are saved by faith. That's where it begins, folks. It does not begin with doing something. It begins with your faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 7 Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So we are considered to be like the children of Abraham. We are adopted into this. We are adopted as the chosen people. And by the way, we have one thing better than even the Old Testament Jewish person. And it's a major thing. We have salvation through Jesus Christ and we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. How many of you have ever heard of the King David? from Israel. Hey, Y'all remember King David? King David was considered to be the best king of, of Israel, period. King David also had some awful sins, too. And we know that during times in King David's life, the Holy Spirit came on him and did great things, but then the Holy Spirit left. Why? Because, see, David was not a Christian. David was Jewish. He was part of the covenantal people. He did not have the washing away of his sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. He would do what every Jewish person did. He would go and he would offer up a sacrifice. At, the, at that time, it would be the tent of meeting or the tabernacle. They didn't have the temple yet. But he would offer that up. It would cover his sins temporarily, but then he would still have sin in his life. That's the problem. But like King David, we are part of that group. But we have something better than even King David had. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave us as a Christian. You know what? We might even be having a bad day. You might be getting up. You might make some bad decisions during that day. But guess what? You're still a Christian. And under the eyes of Jesus, under the eyes of God the Father, Jesus' blood cleanses your sin away. Doesn't mean you might not get a penalty here, but it means your salvation is not in jeopardy. And Paul is telling this to the Galatians that it was by faith Abraham was counted righteous. Verse 8. And the scriptures foreseeing 
that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. This is a key part. How did all the nations be blessed by the Jewish nation? Think about that. You yeah, may, may never have thought about that before. How, did the Jewish, how does the Jewish nation bless us all? How do we get the blessings from them? They are a small country. I've been there a number of times. And I will tell you, it's a nice people. They got a nice economy. But really, how do Jewish people really affect the world? As far as goods, yeah, I like halava. Carol Lee likes halava. That's a, that's a Jewish candy. It's made out of sesame seed. It's quite nice. I enjoy that. I, um, they have ba bagels. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be cute or funny, but what do they really have? Oh, that, that machine that makes soda pop. Have you, you seen those machines that you get the bottle, you get the water, you get the fizzy? That's, that was made in Israel. Now, I will say this. Israel um, also produced a lot of military weapons far greater than a lot of nations. But really, in the physical realm, does Israel really affect us? I do believe this. I believe when the United States have, has sided with Israel over and over again and been a friend, I do believe part of the Abrahamic covenant comes to fruition. Where it says, I will bless them that bless you. We've been blessing Israel. We've been blessed. I really believe some of our blessing, if not all of it, comes from that. God does not break his promises. But it's that last passage, that last portion of Genesis 12, I'll read it to you. Right out of Genesis, it says, And in you, God talking to Abraham, shall all families of the earth be blessed. How is that? It's through Jesus Christ. Because that's who he came from. If you look at his genealogy, he was, came from a Jewish background through Mary. His father is God, given to Mary in a virgin birth setting, special by the Holy Spirit. So through Mary... That is the concluding aspect of that part. And that's how Israel affects the world through the work of Jesus Christ. Because he came as a Jewish man, both man and God. So Paul is telling these Galatians, don't be tricked by these people that are throwing even the Old Testament at you and say, oh, by the way, do you know it says this? And today, in this world, at J, right here where we're at, don't let doctrines come in that say, well, if you don't do this, are you really a Christian? Stop. Have you confessed your sins before the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you asked him to take them away? If you've done that, you've asked him to be your savior, you are a Christian. It's not, well, I did this and I did this, I went to church, I got baptized? No. Baptism, water baptism does not save you. It gets you wet. I don't take away from that. I think it's the, one of the two great ordinances of the church, and it's to show all the church that you know Christ as Savior. It's your test of, first time really for many as being a testimony showing others I know Christ as Savior. It does not save you. It should be done, I believe, but it doesn't save you. And these Galatians of this day were being bombarded. Verse 9. So then they which have be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So Paul turns the table on the Judaizers of that day. Oh, by the way, I know you brought all those things up and that's wonderful. But really, Abraham demonstrates that before the coming of Christ, he believed the ultimate outpouring of God for that time period, and God counted him faithful and righteous. And you, Galatian, you can trust this Savior now with all of the fullness, and you can have it all. And fellow Christians, today in 2020, the first day of November, the world thing, I, this is the year almost that many have said, and I have said it, and I believe it. It's a year I want to forget, you know, sometimes because of all of the things happening. But as one, as one uh, pastor said, 
at this conference that Carolyn, Carolyn and I went to in the earliest part of May, of March, before the pandemic was called, that this gentleman said, today is a hard day, but today is our day. God didn't make a mistake by putting us in this or allowing this to happen around us because he knows that we are the Christians to make the difference in this world today. The Galatians, Paul said, oh foolish Galatians, you're not believing right. My, my prayer today is that, oh great J, all of us at J First Baptist and other Christians in this community, may we stand firm on the proper faith given to us in the word of God and may we not fear and always remember that God does care for us. We've seen how God throughout the ages has taken care of those that followed him. Not always in an easy way, but he took care of them. And even when those who were put at the very edge of death and their lives given for the work and the giving of the work and following Jesus Christ, the people we call martyrs, even in that, the joy would be that they would arrive at the gates of heaven and are therefore in eternity. So even in the hardest of situations, God's still there. So fellow uh, foolish Galatians, be careful. And for us today, be careful with our doctrines. We have to stick with the Bible. Don't add, don't take away. And if we do, we share that same wonderful blessing that Abraham had. And that is a blessing that I desire so much. Let's bow for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again. We do thank you for all that you do for us. And Lord, as we conclude our service today, this thing on the doctrine of the Abrahamic covenant, something we don't always talk about, but it is a most important doctrine because it affects all of us in the coming of you, Jesus. May we be always settled and set well on being that individual who serves you in the most biblical of ways. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all please stand as Jory leads us in Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. I believe it's 411. Let's all stand together, please. We'll only sing two verses of this great hymn. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him and his word. Just to rest upon We will also be having a short business meeting after our service, the end of the service and the morning service. And we will also be having communion service next week. Communion, we're going to be handing out those all-in-one cups. They'll be handed to you as you come to Sunday school and also to the worship service. You'll get them from one of our greeters outside. And uh, when it comes time to the end of the service, we'll have the deacons come forward and we'll go through the communion service. And um, that will be part of our Sunday service next week also. Also, too, Sunday school will be going back to the classes starting ne next week. And so we have all of the classes we were using before the pandemic hit. And I would encourage you with some of the classes, especially if you have a number of people, utilize the protocols that we have with the use of masks, please. That is something that still is being done throughout the 
uh, city, uh, various cities and towns, and that's still, uh, I think, a very good practice. We will also have the, uh, stations for the um, for the uh, hand sanitizer. And let me ask, um, I know we do have people that come and drink coffee. Would you like coffee set out? That's a, one of those gray areas that the state says now. Raise your hand if you'd like coffee out. Okay, then. Okay, you saved me from having to make five big pots of coffee. That's all right. Um, but uh, we will have that, and then we'll meet back in here for the service. And uh, I'm looking forward to that, and hopefully we'll have some more information about what is going on around um, our facility, including the sanctuary building. And uh, we also are having at 530, I will be leading our children's choir upstairs. So we will be meeting for that, and we're not going to stop that. So we will have children's choir. We're going to be preparing for a Christmas cantata. And adult choir, I will be contacting you very shortly. And those for singers, too. And um, especially Ben. Okay, I, 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 I'm going to have to, I, I need to ask a favor of you for Thanksgiving service. We will have a joint service the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and that is going to be a cornerstone. So if you'd like to participate with that, that'll be at 6 o'clock, I believe. Please feel free to come for that. With all that said, let us uh, close. It. Yes, sir. I'm going to leave this up here right after. If any of the kiddos want to put a lot of candy on the way home, feel free. Okay, very good. So I can have some too? Sure. Better real. No, Carolee's shaking her head no. <laughs> I can't have that. I'll get, I'll, get, I'll, get a t I'll get a talking to for that. And just remember, two Saturdays, I'm going to have sheets out for Pastor's Fishing Trip. I'm anxious to see that. I'm anxious to catch some fish. And that, that's going to be a fun time. Well, let's follow for prayer. I'm going to ask um, Derek, if you would please close us in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the uh, privilege of being able to meet in your house, worship you. I just ask that you be with us as we go out into the community. Be with us. Uh, keep us mindful that we do, we do the works because of our salvation, not for our salvation. And just... Uh, all of us bring us here the next time to meet together and worship you again. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.